Sadhu, 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 Sadhu. Budu Saranai, let me welcome you to on this uh, most sacred day, the Vesak Full Moon Poet Day. I think this is a very sacred day for all Buddhists in Sri Lanka as well as the world over. This uh, Vesak day, we commemorate uh, the Tri Mangalaya or the three most significant events in the life of Lord Buddha. The birth of Prince Siddhartha, the Bodhisattva, in the Royal Park of Lumbini in the city of Kapilavastu. His enlightenment in his 35th year under the shade of the Sri Mahabodhya Bodhi in Gaya. And after a successful mission of 45 years, his attainment to Parinibbana in his 80th year in the Upavartana Sala grove of the Malla princess of Kusina. He attained perfectly to the auspicious state of Nibbana. I think that's uh, what everyone is wishing that they will be able to achieve. So on this uh, Vesak uh, Poe Day, uh, as we had we last uh, yesterday too, we had a session. Uh, we have uh, been uh, conducting our programs. Uh, and uh, yesterday we had uh, a pre-day Vesak program. And today we have, that is Sunday the 15th May, that's from 5.30 to 7 p.m., uh, where we are very, very fortunate to have with us the most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, with us. Welcome and Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. Uh, uh, that is today's program. Then on tomorrow, uh, we are having, uh, that is 16th May, two programs. One is from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, the Life of the Buddha conducted by Bhante Sujato. And uh, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., uh, on the topic of what makes the Buddha great by uh, Most Venerable Bhante Henopala Unratna Mahate. So that uh, would be the program uh, that we are having for the Vesakti. So today, as I said, is a very, very uh, special day for all of us, the most sacred day for all Buddhists. I'm sure a lot of you would have observed uh, Sil and uh, some of you may be uh, still uh, observing Sil and some of them may have already given it up so that uh, uh, they will be able to do, do the other activities. So uh, today, as I said, uh, we are very, very fortunate to have with us uh, the most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, his uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi has been conducting a number of programs with us and I'm very, very thankful uh, to venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi for accepting our invitation. We also have with us our other uh, members of our committee who are present here, we have uh, uh, Mr. Uday Ganepola, then we also, uh, who's from the USA, then Mr. Drew, then Drew, uh, Mrs. Drew Ratnayaka from the UK, Drew and Don Ratnayaka, then we also have uh, Mr. Deepal Surya, who is uh, one of our advisors and helping us, uh, then our committee member, Mr. Lalit Unasinghe from Australia. So we are uh, uh, we call ourselves the International Dhamma Program, and I must say that uh, uh, we are having a lot uh, catering to not only the Sri Lankans, but also uh, those who are overseas. Uh, we find that most uh, the participation uh, from many countries have been there for uh, over 15 to 20 countries, the large numbers coming from Australia, USA, UK. Uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and all these other countries. So we are uh, very fortunate that uh, we have uh, uh, these uh, uh, members, then also uh, our own devotees who are present here. So let me uh, uh, welcome this, welcome all of them to our Vesak uh, Dhamma program. And uh, we are uh, sure that this would enable you to really get the meaning of uh, Vesak program. Now, uh, in Sri Lanka, earlier we have been uh, celebrating uh, Vesak Poya, uh, mainly on the uh, Amisa Puja, where we are having counselors, the Vesak celebration. But unfortunately, uh, for the last few years, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, and even currently, uh, those have been done at a very, very 
lesser amount, but we have given quite prominence to the Pratipatti Puja, and that is something that is required uh, by all of us. So we are very happy that today uh, many have observed still, they've gone to their temples and then uh, carried out their duties. Then also the TV, the uh, uh, radio, they have been doing, uh, giving many programs which should have enabled, uh, because today with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have, uh, of course, not only working from home, but also uh, listening and carrying out our activities from home. So that uh, is a big change that has happened. I'm sure that even today, all of you are uh, comfortably seated and listening to this uh, Dhamma program that we are conducting. Now, as I said, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi is a Buddhist monk of American nationality after obtaining a PhD in philosophy from Claremont Graduate School. Uh, he was uh, interested in uh, Buddhism or attracted towards Buddhism uh, in his early 20s and he came to Sri Lanka to enter the Sanghahu. He received the novice ordination in 1972 and the higher ordination in 1973, both under the eminent scholar monk, most venerable Balanguda Ananda Maitya Mahate, with whom he studied Pali and the Dham. He was appointed the editor of the Buddhist Publication Society in Sri Lanka. You know that that is situated in Kandy and they are carrying out a lot of publications. And in 1984, uh, where uh, Venerable uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi was appointed the editor and its president in 1988. So uh, we are very happy because uh, the links with Sri Lanka, because I know that uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi was here for the last uh, Dhamma Desana and I made this request. I know that it was with great difficulty uh, that uh, the Venerable Tero was able to accommodate it, but said, we will have it a little early so that uh, today is going to be a very, very busy day uh, for uh, uh, Venerable uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. But uh, I uh, have a very grateful thanks uh, to mm. Venerable Tero for accepting. Then Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has many important publications to his credit, either as author, translator or editor, including the Buddha, the translation of the Majjima Nikaya. Quote, quotes translated with Venerable Bhikkhu Nanamuli in 1995, the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, a new translation of the Samyukta Nikaya in the year 2000, and in the Buddha's words, 2005, in 2005. So uh, you can see that uh, we are very happy that uh, we have such an erudite uh, scholar monk to do, deliver the Vesak uh, Poya Dhammadesa. In May 2000, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi gave the keynote address at the United Nations headquarters in New York on its first official celebration of Vesak. So you can see that even the UN has recognized uh, Venerable Tero. And in this regard, uh, I must also say that uh, uh, Sri Lanka took a lead role in this. Uh, the late uh, uh, Lakshman Kadrigama, who was then the foreign minister, uh, should also be remembered for the uh, great role that he played in the UN declaring uh, the Vesak Day uh, uh, as an official celebration and many countries have given a holiday. He returned to the US in 2002. He currently resides at Chuang Yang Monastery, that's in uh, New York, and teaches there and at the Bodhi Monastery. Bhikkhu Bodhi, in 2008, Together with several of his students, Bhikkhu Bodhi founded the Buddhist Global Relief, a non-profit supporting hunger relief, sustainable agriculture and education in countries suffering from chronic poverty and malnutrition. In May 2013, he was elected president of the Buddhist Association of the United States. It is commonly known as BAUS, a non-denominational organization dedicated to promoting Buddha's teachings in the United States. So today we are very fortunate uh, to have an erudite uh, scholar monk, the most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, to deliver the Vesak uh, Poe Dhamma Desana. So uh, according to our agenda, the uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi will deliver Pansil and then uh, thereafter the Dhamma Desana, then we will 
after about 50 60 minutes uh, we will have a q and a session kindly send uh, all your questions on q and a and i would request uh, all our dhamma friends uh, please uh, don't use the chat when the dhamma session is going because uh, many of our dhamma friends have told me that that causes disturbance because when you send the message it comes on the uh, screen so please refrain from that uh, because uh, at the end you can send uh, because i know a lot of you like to send uh, uh, thanksgiving and other comments that you can do but q and a uh, we will accommodate the question so please uh, uh, do that because that will really help uh, all of us so let me now uh, uh, with much respect uh, uh, invite the venerable mm. bhikkhu bodhi to deliver pansil and commence the dhamma uh, mm. sermon sadhu 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 Okay, so first I want to thank uh, Mr. Watavala for the introduction. And also I thank the team from the International Dhamma Program for inviting me to give a discourse on the sacred Vesak day, the day commemorating the birth, the enlightenment and the parinibbana of the world's foremost teacher, the fully enlightened Buddha. And I want to wish everybody the blessings of this Vesak day. So for you, now probably Vesak day is drawing to an end for us here in the United States. It's just beginning. And so we'll start the program with the three refuges and the five precepts. And so we join the hands together in the Anjali. And if you have a Buddha image in front of you, you could do the three bows. If you don't have an image, you could just visualize, mentally imagine the Buddha in front of you and you do three bows. Okay. One bow. Second bow. Third bow. <clears throat> and then you do the namaskara. <clears throat> Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato <coughs> Sangang Sarananga Chami Sangang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Buddhang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Buddhang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Damang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Damang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Sangang Sarananga Chami. Dutiampi Sangang Sarananga Chami. Tadiampi Buddham Sarananga Chami. Tadiampi Buddham Sarananga Chami. Tadiampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami. Tadiampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami. Tatiampi Sangang Sarananga Chami. Tatiampi Sangang Sarananga Chami. Sarana Kamanang Sampunang. Amadanti. Panati Pata Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyami. Panati Pata Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyami. Adina dana veramani si kapadang samadhyami. Adina dana veramani si kapadang samadhyami. Kame sumi cha cha ra veramani si kapadang samadhyami. Kame sumi cha cha ra veramani si kapadang samadhyami. Musavada viramani si kapadang samadhyami. Musavada viramani si kapadang samadhyami. Sura meriya maja pamada tana viramani si kapadang samadhyami. 
Okay, so again, I say uh, good. Uh, I, I extend greetings to all of the people who are listening. And again, I express thanks for inviting me to give a discourse on this Vesak Poya Day uh, through the auspices of the International Dharma Program. And I chose for the text to base my discourse today on two suttas that occur one after another in the Anguttara Nikaya Book of the Fours. And both suttas deal with, they have the same theme, the same opening topic. And the topic is four wondrous and amazing things that occur with the manifestation of a Tathagata, an Arahant, a perfectly enlightened one, in the world. And the reason why I like to speak about these two suttas back to back is because they show two different perspectives on, we could say, the amazing and wonderful qualities of the Buddha. And it seems to me, this is my personal interpretation, that the two suttas are intended for people of two complementary but different mental orientations, two ways of connecting to the Dhamma and entering the stream of the Dhamma. The first that I'll speak about, and this is Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Fours, number 127, seems to be formulated and directed towards those who give precedence or prominence to faith and devotion as their way of connecting to the Dhamma and committing themselves to the Dhamma. And the second sutta, the one that follows, Book of Fours, Anguttara Book of Fours, number 128, seems directed towards those who give prominence to, maybe we could say wisdom or understanding as their means of connecting to the Dharma, their means of entering the stream of the Dhamma. Okay, so first we'll explain Sutta number 127 and then move on to Sutta 128. So Sutta number 127 begins with that announcement that there are four wonderful and amazing things that occur when a Tathagata Buddha arises in the world. Okay, the first of those is when the bodhisattva passes away from the Tusita heaven and enters his mother's womb, he does so mindfully and with clear comprehension. That is, he does so with sati and sampajanya. And when this occurs, then in this world, there appears a measureless, glorious radiance surpassing the divine splendor of the devas, of the gods. And when this light appears, the radiance penetrates the entire world, the entire universe. So even in the darkest, deepest regions of outer space, that light penetrates and it's said in the sutta that there are certain types of beings who live, who dwell in those dark, abysmal depths of outer space, who never, under normal conditions, they all think that they're living there alone. They don't have any knowledge of other beings. But when that light appears, then they see that there are other beings living there. So that is said to be the first astounding, wonderful, amazing thing that happens with the manifestation, with the arising of 
the Buddha in the world. And in fact, this happens, of course, before he attains Buddhahood. Now, it might seem to us, particularly maybe those of us who have been brought up in a modern scientific culture where we're inclined to skepticism and kind of a critical outlook on traditional accounts, tradi accounts of traditional accounts of wonders, that this is just exaggeration, that this is the Indian mind full of devotion, full of reverence for the Buddha, sort of constructing a story just for the purpose of glorifying the Buddha. But whether this actually takes place literally or should be understood symbolically, from my perspective, I would say that we have to recognize that even the conception of a future Buddha in the womb, the passing away of a bodhisattva from his last dwelling place into the mother's womb can't be understood just as an ordinary conception, the conception of an ordinary being. Because we have to see that though we speak about the Buddha's birth as taking place on the full moon day of May, sometime maybe in the fifth century of B BC, but actually the beginning of the Buddha's career, his quest for Buddhahood began not in India in the fifth century BC, but according to our Buddhist tradition, it began many, many aeons ago, long, long, deep, deep into the past, when at that time, the person who was to become our Buddha Gotama was a young man by the name of Sumedha, born into a wealthy family. Then his parents passed away when he was a youth and they bequeathed to him a large legacy. So he was a very wealthy young man, but then he looked at his accumulation of wealth and then he reflected. He thought, now my parents have passed away when they were just probably just entering middle age and I have this great accumulation of wealth, but what value is this wealth to me? I could die and pass away at any time even tomorrow I might die, I don't know. So it's pointless for me just to enjoy the wealth, to enjoy the pleasures that the wealth makes possible, but rather I should renounce all of my wealth, all of my belongings and become an ascetic seeking liberation, seeking the deathless. And so he gave up his wealth. He became an ascetic by the name of, still with the name Sumedha, and he was dwelling in a little hermitage on the side of a mountain. And in a short time, because he had mature faculties, he could master the samapattis, the meditative absorptions, and the mundane abhinyas, the spiritual powers. And then he was enjoying himself, delighting in the bliss and equanimity of samadhi. But one day, when he came down to the town to go on alms round, he saw that there was a lot of celebrations going on. Decorate, the town was fully decorated and people were setting up, they were beautifying the town and setting up decorations. And he asked somebody, what's going on? What's happening today? And then people told him, didn't you hear? The Buddha, Deepankara, has appeared in the world and he is going to visit our city. This is the capital city today. I think it's called Hangzavati. And so we are preparing the city to welcome the Buddha and his Sangha. And they were all hard at work preparing the city for the Buddha to arrive. And Sumedha asked, can I contribute in some way too? And they told him, we need all of the help we can get. Your job, you can work on smoothing the road because the road was muddy. And so as Sumedha is working, clearing away the mud and dirt and water from the road, a light appears in front of him and he looks up and what is happening? But he sees walking down the road, the Buddha Dipankara himself accompanied by 
a large number of monks. And as they come closer and closer, the road is not yet cleared of the mud. And so Sumedha lies down with his body prostrate in the mud and looks up and invites the Buddha to walk over his body so that the Buddha won't get his feet soiled by the mud. And while he is looking up at the Buddha, he's so impressed by the Buddha that he realizes that if he were to listen to and to practice the Buddha's teaching there and then, he would immediately be able to attain enlightenment himself and gain arhatship liberation. But he's so impressed by the Buddha that there arises in his mind spontaneously the wish, the aspiration to become a Buddha in the future. And so he formulates that wish, may I at some future time become a fully enlightened Buddha and guide the world across the ocean of samsara. And while that thought is running through his mind, Tipankara Buddha looks down at him, reads his mind, and then tells the, the community that's gathered around, do you see this young ascetic lying in the mud? In future time, this young man is going to become a fully enlightened Buddha who will be known as Gotama. And then he tells some other things that will occur in the future. And so this is called the Vayakarana, the prediction to future Buddhahood. And at that moment, the ascetic Sumedha becomes a Niyata Bodhisattva, that is one who is fixed in destiny to attain complete full enlightenment. And then for many, many aeons after that, it said four immeasurables and a hundred thousand great aeons. This person practiced the 10 spiritual perfections, the paramis accumulating vast, vast accumulations of merits and of wisdom, of knowledge. And so when he comes into his last existence before the final existence. He's reborn as a deva in the Tusita heavenly world. At that time, he has vast accumulations of all the splendid, beautiful, wholesome qualities. His mind is rich in generosity, in moral training, renunciation, wisdom, patience, determination. He's fully endowed with the four Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, equanimity. So all of those qualities have been accumulated to the highest degree over so many aeons. And so this is not just like an ordinary person who's going to be taking birth, but this is somebody who has fulfilled all of the requirements for attaining full enlightenment. And then at a certain point, it said that the devas from the different heavenly realms come to this deva, who's the sort of the reigning prince of the Tusita heaven. They come to him and say, the time has now arrived. This is your time to descend into the human world and to complete your destiny to attain Buddhahood. And so then this deva in the Tusita heaven looks down at the earth, down at the human world and makes some assessments determining that this is exactly the time for me to pass away and take a human birth. So then it said he, with mindfulness and clear comprehension, he leaves the Tusita heaven, not just through the blind working of karma, but as an act of intention, an act of determination, knowing that he is going to enter the mother's womb and begin his last human life before 
becoming the supreme world teacher as a fully enlightened Buddha. So for this reason, this is, it seems to me that when it's said that this glorious radiance appears in the world, whether you take this symbolically or literally, but it's a way of testifying to the fact that this being who has just entered the mother's womb has brought along this vast, measureless, inconceivable, incalculable accumulation of the most splendid, wholesome, magnificent, virtuous qualities, the qualities that equip him to function as a world teacher, a teacher whose teaching is going to spread over the world and lead to the liberation, the spiritual upliftment of countless beings through many, many centuries. Okay, so that is the first wondrous and amazing thing that takes place when a Tathagata is about to appear in the world. Then the second wondrous and amazing thing So it said that when a bodhisattva emerges from his mother's womb, he does so mindfully and with clear comprehension, again with sati and sampajanya. And then when he emerges from the womb, then again, a measureless glorious radiance appears surpassing the divine majesty of the gods, of the devas. Okay, so after spending, it said, after spending 10 months in the womb of his mother, who's called Queen Mahamaya, then at a certain point, the queen felt that her pregnancy was coming to term, she was ready to give birth. And so they were living in Kapilavattu, in what is now part of Nepal, and she decided that she wanted to go to her ancestral family home to give birth. And so she asked permission of her husband, King Sudodana, who allowed her to go. And then as she was walking together with her entourage, they came to a park or a garden halfway between Kapilavattu and her native city, Devadaha. That park is called the Lum Lumbini Garden. And just then she felt the birth pains come upon her. And so she grabbed hold of the branch of a tree and while standing up, then she gave birth to the Bodhisattva. And again, the account that's come down in the tradition mentions a number of wonders that accompany the birth. First, she gave birth standing up, not lying down. And when the little baby came out from the womb, he was received first, not by human beings, but by the four Mahabrahmas, by four Brahma deities. And they passed the little baby on to four devas, four devas. And meanwhile, some streams of water, warm and cold water, poured down from the sky to bathe the baby and his mother. And then the baby was given over to human hands and then when the baby was placed on the ground, <laughs> it didn't lie there like an ordinary baby. This is the traditional account, but it stood on its feet. It looked in all directions. And then it took seven steps to the north. And with each step, a lotus flower sprung up from the ground under the feet. And then the little baby pointed upwards to the sky with one, arm, with one hand downward to the ground with the other hand <clears throat> and said, in this world, together with its devas, I am the foremost, I am the best, I am the supreme teacher. This is my last birth. There is no more re -exist re renewed existence. This is the life in which I will attain full liberation. Okay, so this is the birth of the Buddha, again, accompanied by wonders. And when the Buddha appears, comes out from the mother's womb, again, 
this glorious radiance appears. We, we could take it, if you like, take it symbolically, take it literally. I don't have a way to determine between the two. But in any case, we could see that glorious radiance as a expression, a manifestation, a visible manifestation of all of the vast spiritual accumulations that are sort of stored up in the stream of consciousness of that little baby. So babies look very, very much alike to our eyes, but if we could see into the minds of little babies, we could see this baby is going to grow up to be a bad person. That baby is going to be maybe a good, worthy citizen contributing to his community and to society. This baby will just be uh, an ordinary worker. That baby maybe will be a scientist. That baby will be a politician. So the difference in the destinies depend upon the accumulations, the tendencies, the dispositions. And if we were to look at this baby just born in the Lumbini garden, and we had the super divine eye, we would be able to read the consciousness of that baby and see this baby is going to be a fully enlightened Buddha. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of the details of the events after the birth, because we want to move on pretty much sticking to this sutta itself. But we know that after the birth as Siddhartha, he was given the name Siddhartha, which means Siddha is accomplished and Atta or Arta is aim. As he grew up, he enjoyed the pleasures of three mansions, the pleasures of the palace life. He was married to a beautiful princess named Yasodhara. And then in his 29th year, he began to reflect deeply upon the nature of human life and came to realize, and we find this expressed in quite human terms in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 26, the discourse on the noble quest, not the legendary account of the four sights. We have this in psychological terms, he's reflecting that here I am, a young man with all of the desirable acquisitions of life, living in luxury and power, but I'm subject to repeated birth, subject to grow old, subject to fall ill, subject to death. Why should I just pursue material goods that are also subject to birth, old age, decay, sickness, and death? Let me leave the home life and go forth into homelessness to seek that which is not born, which does not age, which does not die, which does not fall ill, the deathless Nibbana. Then he goes forth into homelessness, he strives for six years, learning various systems of meditation, mastering the arupa, the formless samapattis, the meditative absorptions, practicing ascetic practices, carrying them to their utmost degree. Then he gives up the ascetic practices, resumes taking normal food, regains his strength and vigor, and then finds a splendid, piece of a uh, piece of land on the banks of the Neranjara River and then sits down cross-legged and makes the determination, I won't arise from the seat until I have realized my goal, achieve the supreme enlightenment. And then there comes in the traditional account, the battle with Mara, who represents the forces of bondage, the forces of the defilements. He dispels the armies of Mara. He enters the four jhanas, then achieves the three higher knowledges, the knowledge of past lives, the divine eye by which he can see the workings of karma in the lives of others. And then 
in the last watch of the night, he attains the destruction of the asavas, of the defilements. And so together, these knowledges are called the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment. And so then we come to the third wonder spoken of in the sutta, when a Tathagata awakens to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment, then in this world, a measureless, glorious radiance appears, surpassing the divine majesty of the devas, of the gods. So first I want to say a few words about this expression in Pali, the Anuttara Samma Sambodhi. When I was a young, well, actually even before I became a monk, when I was learning Buddhism, we always spoke of this as the Sambodhi, as enlightenment. The Buddha was called the enlightened one and the Sambodhi was called enlightenment. But then, and after I became a monk, when I was reading other translators like Venable Jnana Moli, Venable Jnana Ponika, Jnana Taloka, they always rendered this expression as the perfect enlightenment or supreme enlightenment. In recent years, I've noticed that there's been a shift among, I have to say, Western translators saying that enlightenment is not correct, it should be called awakening. But I have to say, I disagree with this. <laughs> First of all, to me, the word enlightenment suggests a profound, comprehensive, all-embracing kind of knowledge and understanding, whereas awakening seems to me something rather relatively trivial, like just a momentary flash of insight. That can be an awakening, but a vast, comprehensive knowledge. We need another expression. And for me, the word enlightenment conveys that meaning much more satisfactorily than awakening. And then some argue that the verb bujati properly means to awaken. And so they say that's the justification for using awakening. But I read, I looked into the text and even some of the grammatical treatises and while the verb bujati can mean awaken, it is also used most more often to mean to understand or to know something through direct perception. And so the idea of to wake up is the meaning of bujati. It's not an exclusive meaning, but the more prevalent meaning is to understand or to know through direct perception. And then another reason why I prefer enlightenment, whenever we find metaphor, metaphors or imagery used in the text to illustrate the Sambodhi, the common metaphor is that of light arising, dispelling darkness. So the Buddha says after the enlightenment, this would be in Majjhima Sutta number four, 19, a number of other suttas, he said, Darkness was dispelled and light arose. Ignorance was dispelled and vija, knowledge, arose. So we find again and again, ignorance is compared to darkness and the sambodhi is compared to light. I haven't been able to find any place in the text in which, in which the Buddha compares ignorance to being asleep and some bodhi to waking up. Okay, so anyway, so here went the third wondrous event in the life of the Buddha is that when he attains perfect enlightenment, then a glorious radiance appears in the world. And we could say that that glorious radiance is a kind of symbolic representation or a symbolic um, manifestation of the knowledge, the all embracing, all comprehending knowledge that arises in the mind now of the Buddha as he's sitting under the Bodhi tree. And that knowledge is so vast, so comprehensive that even though the breakthrough might be momentary, but it takes him seven weeks remaining in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree 
to fully assimilate that knowledge, to absorb it into his being, and to undergo all of the transformations, the inner transformations that that knowledge brings about even within his physical body. So that is the third wonder. And then the fourth wonder occurs after the enlightenment, when the Buddha, as he's still sitting in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree, and after that period of seven weeks, then a question arises in his mind. Should I try to share this realization that I've achieved with others? Should I try to transmit the Dharma to others? And as that question takes shape in his mind, his initial inclination is to remain silent. He thinks to himself, this Dharma that I've attained is profound, hard to see and understand, but people are not interested in things like this. They like to go to sporting events, soccer matches. What's the pop, pop of sport in Sri Lanka? Cricket matches, where they like to go to shows, musicals. And so if I go out and start teaching the Dhamma, dukkha, 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 people think, what is dukkha? What are you talking about? We go to, a, go to the movies, go to a musical show. That's sukkha, sukkha, sukkha. So he thinks, ah, no point trying to teach. Let me just keep silent. But then as that thought is taking shape in his mind, then it said, Brahma Sahampati, one of the high divinities, thinks the mind of the fully enlightened Buddha is inclining to silence rather than to teaching. And so Maha Brahma drops down from the heavenly world, from the divine world, appears in front of the Buddha, joins his hands in Anjali and says, Bhante, don't think like that. Yeah. Most people will go to the soccer matches, the football matches, the cricket matches, the baseball, football, or they'll be looking on their cell phones at the latest Facebook and TikTok and whatever. But there are some around with little dust in their eyes who can understand if you don't teach, they're lost. So please, Bhante, go out and teach. And then he makes that decision okay, I'm going to go out and teach. And then he slowly winds his way along the roadways from Bodh Gaya, what's now Bodh Gaya, to the deer park near Benares, the deer park now called Sanat. And he finds the five ascetics who had previously attended upon him. And then he expounds to them the middle path and the four noble truths. And so that is called setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma, the unsurpassed wheel of the Dharma. And so when the Buddha sets in motion the unsurpassed wheel of the Dharma, then in this world, this measureless, glorious radiance becomes manifest. And here we could say the glorious radiance represents the transmission of the light. Because up to this point, the Buddha has contained the light of wisdom within himself. This is, he said that Chakung Udapati, so the eye, when he attained enlightenment, the eye arose, knowledge arose, wisdom arose, clear understanding arose, the light arose. So that was the light within himself. But now he teaches the Dhamma, expounds the Four Noble Truths. And while he's expounding this first discourse in one of those five ascetics, the one called Kondanyo, the eye of Dhamma arises. He sees the same truth that the Buddha saw. And he, with that arising of the eye of Dhamma, 
he enters the path and fruition of stream entry and becomes bound to enlightenment himself, bound to liberation. And so now the light has been transmitted from teacher to the first accessible pupil. And now the Buddha knows my mission is accomplished. Of course, not fulfilled, but at least the first stage of the mission has been achieved. The light has passed from my own mind of wisdom to the mind of Kandanyo. And then over the next week or so, from the Buddha to the other four ascetics until there are first five stream enterers. And then with the Anatta Lakana Sutta, they, all the five achieve arhatship. And now the Buddha has five fully liberated disciples around him. And so this is the transmission of the light. And so to represent this, this measureless glorious radiance becomes manifest. Okay, so this is now, so that completes our exposition of Sutta Anguttara Nikaya 4's number 127. So we have the four amazing things that become manifest with the appearance of a Buddha in the world when he descends from the heaven, from the Tusita heaven into the mother's womb, a light appears. When he takes birth, a light appears. When he achieves the enlightenment, a light appears. When he turns the wheel of Dharma and a disciple understands, then a light appears. Okay, now we come to Sutta number 128, which again opens with the same statement, same opening statement, with the manifestation of a Tathagata in the world, four wonderful and amazing things occur. Okay, so what are these four? Okay, the first of them, I already hinted at this earlier. People delight in attachment, take delight in attachment, rejoice in attachment. But when the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma of non-attachment, people want to listen. They lend an ear and they apply their minds to understand it. That's the first amazing thing that occurs when a Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha, appears in the world. Yeah, so here, this statement revolves around a word, a word that's translated, attached, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> for convenience, I translated the word as attachment, but the Pali word is actually rather difficult to adequately translate. The Pali word is alaya with a long A, L-A-Y-A. And the word has several nuances of meaning, several sort of suggestive nuances. So one nuance is that of attachment, but alaya is also a place where one dwells, an abode where things accumulate. So we call the mountains in Northern India and the Nepal and Tibet, we call them the Himalaya mountains. So Hima is snow. And there, the second part of that word is the same word, Alaya, a place where snow accumulates. And so the, accumul the abode of snow is the Himalaya. So a Alaya is a dwelling place. It's the kind of place to which we become attached not just outer objects of attachment, but it's even the sense of property, the sense of what is mine, what belongs to me. And we actually find the same word Yeah. 
used in Majjhima Nikaya number 26 and parallel passages after his enlightenment, when the Buddha is thinking, well, should I go out and teach the Dhamma? Because this Dhamma is very profound. Then he reflects, this generation delights in alaya, takes delight in alaya, rejoices in alaya. So it is that same word. And so that word seems to have a very broad sense of all of the things to which we become attached, all of the things in which we try to find worldly delight. And so that is sort of the sticking place, the glue that binds people to sangsara, the, all of these objects of attachment. And the Dhamma is about unalaya about removing that attachment. And so if you go to the cricket game and say, come away, there's a Dhamma discourse over the internet, people don't want to turn away from it. Or if you say that there's a great musical going on, people don't want to turn away. But when the Buddha teaches, the Buddha has such compelling presence and such skillful means and teaching that he's able to lead us away from attachment. And we think that the objects of attachment, that is our support, that what, def what defines our identity, what we build up our sense of identity upon, our position, our status, our titles, our wealth, our standing, our respect in the eyes of others. And the Buddha speaks about breaking all points of attachment and dwelling in the signless, the desireless, in emptiness. And yet people are seeking signs, seeking things to lean upon, seeking things, seeking fullness rather than emptiness. But when people listen to the Dhamma, then if they have the right disposition, then a flash of understanding will arise and they turn towards the Dhamma of non-attachment. And as they practice and find greater and greater fulfillment in the Dhamma, then the attachments, the alaya falls away until they realize and dwell in non-attachment, unalaya. So that is the first wondrous and amazing thing about the appearance of the Buddha in the world. Okay, the second wondrous and amazing thing about the appearance of the world, people delight in conceit, take delight in conceit, rejoice in conceit. But when the Tathagata, the Buddha is teaching the Dhamma for the removal of conceit, for obliterating conceit, people wish to listen, lend an ear, and they apply their minds to understand it. So that is the second amazing thing about the appearance of a Buddha in the world. So here the key term is in Pali, mana, which we translate as conceit. And the text explain that conceit occurs in three modes. There is the superiority conceit, I am better. The equal conceit, I am equal to, or I'm just as good as. And the inferiority conceit, oh, I'm worse than, I'm not as good as, everybody is better than me. I'm so miserable, so wretched. So that's the inferiority conceit. But the kind of conceit that people delight in is the superiority conceit. So here I am, I'm Mahatera, so I am superior. They are just newly ordained monks. Um, 
or I have this position in society. I'm the president of the corporation, the CEO. They are just workers in the corporation. Or I am beautiful and they are not so beautiful. Or I am the rich one or I am powerful. I have such high status. So those are all sort of bases of conceit. And in ancient India, of course, there was the caste system. So I am a Brahmin. They are just um, Vaishyas or Sudras or outcasts, or I am a Kshatriya of royal blood, and they are just Vaishyas, Sudras, outcasts. So there is that conceit. And yet, and then that conceit, that notion, I am, I am superior. We build up our whole identity around the things that we feel superior about. And if we don't have any skills at all, if everybody is putting us down, then we look around for somebody who's a little bit worse than us, a little bit lower than us. And then we use that to build up our superiority conceit and we push them down. So this is actually a rather sad account of how discrimination works and oppression through a society. Like if there is say within Indian society, the Shudras are the fourth, the lowest of the four social castes, but below the Shudras are the outcasts like the Chandalas. And so when a Sudra meets a Chandala, then they will beat the Chandala or insult them or abuse them. Because even though they are abused by the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas and the Vaishyas, but still they're superior, they're socially superior to the outcasts. And the same thing goes on in so many societies. Okay, but what the Buddha teaches is that this conceit always revolves around the notion I am. And the notion I am revolves around the idea of I, taking the I to be a solid, substantial reality. So what the Buddha teaches, the fundamental realization and teaching of the Buddha is anatta, anatmaya, non-self, that there is no substantial, solid, core to our identity, that our being is just this assemblage of five aggregates, which are all ne tang mama, ne so hamasmi, ne so me ata. This is not mine, not what I am, not myself. And when we see into the truth of non-self, and first the theoretical idea of the self gets cut off. But still there lingers the subtle conceit I am, but we go deeper with our insight till we penetrate the more deep, the deeper level of anatta. And then the conceit I am vanishes. But instead of leading to misery and dejection, I don't have any self anymore. That becomes the joyful exuberant, exhilarating liberation. Wow, how wonderful and magnificent, completely free of bondage to the notion of I am this. And so when people hear this, they want to listen. So that is the second wonder with the appearance of a Tathagat in the world. The third wonder, people delight and excitement take delight and excitement, rejoice in excitement. So this we could see you know, so widely, like if you're watching the television, the show is a little bit boring, you take the remote device and start clicking around looking for some exciting program. So you see like, what are the exciting movies and TV programs? I guess the most exciting two themes are crime, uh, maybe four, four themes, crime movies, horror movies, <laughs> mysteries, and 
romance, maybe with a little sexual content. So those are the, <laughs> the exciting themes of the movies, TV programs. And then of course there are sporting events where people go rooting for the, I root for my team, you are rooting for your team, or they like to go to horse races and you're seeing the horses running around the ring. You bet on the horses. That's my horse, it's running, running. Oh no, it's falling behind. Oh, go, go run faster, faster, faster. <laughs> okay, so this is the way people, they delight in excitement. And then you tell them, you meditate, you just observe the breath in and out, breathing in and out, in and out. Okay, I want to gain samadhi. I want to gain deep insights on breathing in, breathing out. This is boring. This is dull. I'm getting drowsy, drowsy, drowsy. No, I can't do this. Then up from the meditation seat to the television. What's on TV? Well, let me call my friends. So we'll go out to a, maybe go out to a dance or. Okay, so people like this excitement, but the Buddha teaches the Dhamma that leads to peace, to quiescence, to stillness. And so people, though they delight in excitement, in restlessness, but what people are really seeking are peace, is peace, quiescence. <clears throat> And so when they hear about this Dhamma that leads to peace, then they want to listen, lend an ear, and try to understand it and to practice it. <clears throat> so that's the third astounding and amazing thing that occurs with the appearance of a Buddha in the world. <clears throat> okay, the fourth wondrous thing People are immersed in ignorance, completely enveloped in ignorance, just like the inside of an egg is enclosed by the eggshell. But when the Buddha teaches the Dhamma for the removal of ignorance, people want to listen, they lend an ear and set their minds on understanding. So I think this last quality highlights an important aspect of the Buddha's teaching. Maybe we could say the most important aspect that it sort of revolves around not just blind faith and devotion, not around just rituals and ceremonies. In fact, it doesn't even revolve around just mastering states of deep stillness and inner peace, samadhi concentration, but the Buddha's teaching centers around the development of panya, wisdom, vipassana, insight, avijja, clear knowledge, jnana, deep understanding. And so for the Buddha, the root of all of our bondage, of all our dukkha or suffering, the root at the starting point of dependent origination is avijja, ignorance. And that ignorance is like a cloud, a mist that envelops the whole world. But the Buddha's teaching is aimed at obliterating ignorance, at clearing up these clouds so that the light of the sun can shine through. And so the Buddha's teaching is aim to show us how to develop wisdom. And then when we hear these teachings of wisdom, the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, the three marks of existence, they seem so real, so convincing, so absolutely indisputable. And when we're told that is your key to liberation, that is the way to gain the highest liberation, the highest peace, the supreme happiness and freedom, then we want to listen and we try to understand. 
Okay, so those are the four astounding and amazing things that become manifest with the appearance of the Buddha. That when the Buddha teaches the Dhamma, people who delight in objects of attachment turn their minds in the direction of non-attachment. People who are dominated by conceit apply their minds to eliminating conceit. People who delight in excitement turn their minds to quiet and to peace. And people who are immersed in ignorance turn their minds to developing wisdom in understanding. Okay, and with that, I will maybe bring the discourse to an end and then maybe we can use the remaining time for, for questions. Okay, and thank you all for your attention. Mm -hmm. And again, I wish you all the blessings of Vesak, and I hope this talk has been in some way helpful to you. Thank you very much, and sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I think uh, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, today is the most sacred day for mm -hmm. all Buddhists world over and in mm -hmm. Sri Lanka. I think uh, the most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, the uh, Dhamma talk that you gave today, I think, uh, went uh, very much over than, than what we uh, really thought of. It really gave the real meaning mm -hmm. and also attracted all our participants to listen mm -hmm. very, very carefully because mm -hmm. I think uh, this would have been one of the best uh, Dhamma servants that uh, anyone would have heard. And especially on this uh, very special day, uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, Vesak Poe Day, of mm -hmm. which uh, Venerable Bhikkhu has been speaking of. So uh, uh, we have a few questions, but before mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, we have one of our uh, eminent uh, advisors and also uh, uh, one who is deeply involved with the meditation area, Mr. Deepal Suryarachi. So Deepal, can I ask you to uh, maybe very briefly uh, ask any questions or a short comment uh, about uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, Dhamma talk. Yeah, sadhu, sadhu. Actually, it was indeed uh, a very uh, uplifting sermon, Bhante, much merit to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think when you bring it uh, to light from the sutras themselves, mm. and uh, particularly the contrasting the the four amazing things that appeals to Shraddha and the four amazing things that appeals to uh, Panya. Mm. I think it's an amazing way of presenting mm. the Buddha. Mm. And I particularly like uh, the way that you uh, distinguished uh, the word uh, Alaya. You know, it's not only just attachment to things, but the whole mm. being of, you know, where we are mm. and why we are so linked to it. And I think, you know, and, and I think you, you put uh, through this sutra the, the real miracle that mm. uh, this is not what people normally want to hear, but yeah, yeah. this is what has happened. Yeah, yeah. Right? So even after 2,500 years, yeah, yeah. still in yeah. this height of excitement, still there are people who are looking for peace and listen to yeah. Dhamma. And I think you did a fantastic uh, sermon for today on the Vesak day, it, uh, it deepens our Shraddha on the most enlightened one, Sad Sad. Uh, thank you, Deepal. Uh, uh, Venerable Tero, we will uh, take uh, some of the questions. One is, uh, uh, most venerable sir, Buddha's uh, teaching expects his followers to practice Pratipati Puja, like following the precepts and meditation. When and how did the practice of Amisa Puja, which are ritualistic, are practiced by modern day Buddhists? Let's say the last part of the question, I didn't quite catch uh, it. Amisa... When, when and how did the practice of Amisa Puja, yeah. which are ritualistic, yeah. uh, are practiced by modern day Buddhists? I think what he's saying is that a lot of yeah. them are giving uh, more prominence to Amisa Puja than uh, Pratipati Puja. And as to when that uh, really came about. Yeah, of course, this would require some kind of like historical um, 
investigation into, but I would assume, first of all, during the Buddha's lifetime, of course, the Buddha and the monastics depended for their sustenance on alms offering for the, from the lay people. At, well, and so they would go daily on alms round, excuse me, <coughs> they would go, <coughs> I, get, I tend to get phlegm in my yeah. throat and it's a, a humid day today. So it's, yeah. um, so they would depend for their sustenance on alms offerings from the lay people. So every day they would go on Pindapata and people would make offerings to them. And then they would depend for the residents on having temples or monasteries or kudis and depend on the robe offerings of robes and in times of illness or other occasions, they need offerings of medicines, medicinal materials. So already in that way, there was Amisa Puja in the time of the Buddha because without the offerings of the material requisites, the monastic community couldn't, couldn't survive. Um, and I think it likely against the background of ancient India, maybe even during the Buddha's time, people would bring offerings of flowers and maybe incense, maybe lambs. But it's possible also, this may be, I'm just speculating here, that as Hinduism became more prominent in India with the passage of time, especially the form of bhakti Hinduism, you know, devotional Hinduism, where the offerings to the deities, like to Shiva, to Krishna, to Vishnu, becomes important part of practice, then that influence, that kind of practice had an impact on Buddhism as well. So we have then the Buddha images. You have to remember during the first, what, 300 years, 400 mm. years of Buddha's history, no images human images of the Buddha. The Buddha is represented just symbolically by the tree, by a footprint, by a Dhamma wheel. But as Buddha images came into use, probably then the devotional aspect of making material offerings to the Buddha image became prominent. But you know, to be able to answer that question in detail when we need somebody who's a scholar in the de historical development of, of popular Buddhism. Thank you. The next question, uh, Venerable, for someone so intent on reaching the Buddhahood for so long, in your opinion, why do you think he had to undergo such a difficult time investigating and searching for that thread which would launch him in the right direction towards enlightenment? I guess the question is why he had to go through such a difficult process in his last life as, as Gotama, as Siddhartha. I, I think that's the intent of the question. Um, okay. I think the commentaries explain this. They say that he had committed some unwholesome deeds long ago in the past. And so as the karmic fruition of those deeds, he had to undergo this long period of ascetic practice. I'm not sure that I agree with that. It seems to, this is my opinion, and it's just an opinion. In India, during the Buddha's time, the ideal, or at least in certain schools of thought, the ideal way to achieve liberation was through these extreme ascetic practices, Atakila Matanu Yoga, the practice of self mortification. And so for the Buddha to be able to convince the Indian ascetic communities that the middle way is, and not the ascetic way, is the true way to enlightenment. The Buddha has to carry on the ascetic practices and take them as far as, or even further than anybody of his time has carried them. And so the Buddha takes the ascetic practices to their ultimate degree, almost to the point of his own physical death. And then he can come back and say, no, the ascetic practices, the 
self-modification. That is not the way to liberation. We have to maintain the body in a healthy condition and instead devote our efforts, our energy towards moral and spiritual cultivation, not towards physical torturing of the body. That would be my understanding. The next question is, uh, what is the difference between Chakkum Udapadi and Aloko Udapadi? I don't see a significant difference. They're just two different metaphors or two different images representing the arising of the three middle terms represent what really arose. Jnana, Panya, Vija, three terms for knowledge or understanding. And so you could see that metaphorically, as your eyes have been shut, then you open the eyes and you could see what's in front of you. And the other metaphor is you've been in darkness and now light is shining. And so that represents knowledge arising. Yeah. Next question, what will be the relationship between full moon day and Buddha's birth, enlightenment and Parinibbana? As per current scientific findings, only one side of moon can be visible from the earth which symbolizes the synchronized rotation of moon with the earth and only one moon exists for the earth. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. It's but, a relationship between the full moon day and Buddha's birth and of course also it's just, commenting I, on the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, in even from the time long before the arising of the Buddha, within the sort of Indian religious practices, the full moon day was considered an especially auspicious day because the moon is, you know, full moon is shining brightly in the sky. And I remember the time when, when I was living in, in the forest hermitage outside Kandy in Sri Lanka, on the full moon day, when sometimes I would step outside outside of the hermitage and into the forest. And the forest is so brightly illuminated by the full moon. It's just almost you could take a book out in the full moon and read by the moonlight. And so it's considered especially auspicious. And so for that reason, the major events in the life of the Buddha are connected with the full moon day. I didn't understand the part about the astronomical yeah. formations, but I don't think that's really so relevant. Right. Yeah. Just the important point is that the full moon is, you know, the, the when the moon is full, then it's bright and illuminates everything. And so it's a symbol, an aus, you know, auspicious symbol. Thank you, uh, Venerable. Dear Bhante, the Bodhisattva learned the sublime meditations from other sects before enlightenment. Were those the four jhanas? Well, in the suttas, what is said is that under his first meditation teacher, Alara Kalama, the Buddha learned the meditation of the base of nothingness, the Akinchanyayatana, which is the third Arupa Samapati, the third formless meditation. And then under his second teacher, Uttaka Ramaputta, he learned the Nevasanyana Sanyayatana, the base of neither perception nor non perception, which is the, fo the fourth formless meditative absorption. The suttas don't say anything about him learning the jhanas beforehand, but it's said in the commentaries that in order to learn the arupas, he had to have learned and previously mastered the jhanas and the two lower formless absorptions. So I would assume that he had also learned the jhanas and the formless, the two lower formless absorptions before mastering the third and fourth formless absorptions. Thank you, Bhante. The next one, uh, blessings to you, Reverend Sir. Uh, please, can you clarify the characteristics of a stream enter? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, 
Okay, so in the suttas, there are two ways in which the stream entera is characterized. One is in terms of the qualities that are eliminated, and the other is in terms of certain qualities that are acquired or possessed. So the things that are eliminated are said to be the three lower fetters of the 10 fetters, the lower three, with the attainment of stream entry, one eradicates the three lower fetters. Those three lower fetters are the view of a substantial self existing in relation to the five aggregates, that's so called Sakaya Ditti. The second is doubt, which means doubt about the Buddha and his teaching. And the third is Sila Bhatta Paramasa, sometimes translated as clinging to rites and rituals, but I don't think that's quite accurate. I take it to be clinging to certain rules and ascetic practices in the belief that just observing these rules and undergoing these ascetic practices, that that will be the means to liberation. And so the stream entera has, through his practice of insight, has seen into the truth of the Dhamma. And so he's eliminated the view of self because he's seen the truth of non-self, absolutely seen it. And because he's seen the truth of the Dhamma, he's overcome doubt. So it's just like before stream entry, I don't have a little object. Um, it's like I was holding, let's say, a little fruit in my hand. So I say, do, you, do I have a fruit or not? And you have some doubt whether I have a fruit. But if I open my hand, you see my hand is empty, then you know that I don't have a fruit. And so because the stream mentor has seen the truth of the Dhamma, he no longer has doubt about the Dhamma, no longer doubt that the Buddha is the one who realized the Dhamma. And yeah, and then because he's seen that it's sila samadhi panya that leads to realization, he's eliminated this attachment to merely to observing certain rules and ascetic practices. Thank you, Venerable Thero. Uh, we have a few more questions. I know that uh, Venerable Thero has to leave uh, early. Can we take one or two more? Uh, what do yeah, you... we could. Well, you could say uh, one yeah. or two more. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful talk, Venerable Sir. In today's world, where humanity is moving further towards attachment, conceit, excitement, and ignorance. What is Venerable Thero's advice to the world? Maybe I say that's too big a question to deal with right. in the time slot allotted to me, because we have our Vesak celebration here. In 20 minutes, I have to be up, yeah, yeah. up, the, up the hill. One more small question. Uh, yeah. Bhante, could you give an introduction to meditation and mindfulness? I don't know whether it could be answered maybe just uh, briefly. Um, I wouldn't try to do that in, again yeah. in the time slot. Right. That, that, but there are probably many programs available, whatever country the person is in. If they're in a Buddhist country, there will be I'm sure courses and programs in mindfulness and meditation. If you're in a country without access to those instructions, you can find many recording, many videos on YouTube or elsewhere on the internet, giving instructions and in basic mindfulness and meditation practices. Yeah. To give any adequate instructions, it takes about 20 minutes, but if you yeah. join, on Saturday mornings, I usually have a program from 9.30 on Eastern time. So we have a sutta discourse later in the morning, but from 9.30 to 10 past 10, we have a 40 minute period of guided meditation. So you could join through the website of the Buddhist Association of the United States. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Venerable Tero. So uh, I think uh, uh, we need to finish on time. So can yeah. I uh, request uh, uh, our committee member Uday Ganepola to uh, uh, pay merit to uh, Venerable uh, Pikku Bodhi? Sure. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, Professor Watavar, for organizing this very meritorious uh, event in, in, in this most auspicious Vesak day. It is indeed a, a great privilege to express our deep gratitude and appreciation on behalf of our international Dhamma program and its most dedicated Dhamma friends. Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, you gave us an amazing discourse on both historical and philosophical perspective of the birth of our Lord Buddha uh, uh, and, and the Bhikkhu Bodhi, you took us on the path to understand Buddha's teachings, citing several suttas. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi has contributed immensely to the promotion of Buddhism, not only here in the US, but all over the world. Uh, I remember I was in that event uh, when UN declared Buddhist uh, Vesaka as a holiday and Bhikkhu Bodhi led the march with uh, several um, leading Buddhist monks at that time and thousands and thousands of Buddhists all marching in a big park in the city. It was in May 2000, and I, I still remember that. So Bhikkhu Bodhi has a long uh, story, long uh, uh, record of promoting Buddhism, not only in the US, all over the world, uh, with his books and translations and discourses and various things he offered on a daily basis. So uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, I, we want to thank you uh, and express our deep appreciation for inviting for accepting our invitation so compassionately mm -hmm. to celebrate this auspicious Vesak full moon day with us. Uh, we had all almost 200 and or almost 300 uh, Zoom attendees of this program. And we all want to give you uh, merit for mm -hmm. making this event. So, thank so. you. Uh, thank you, Udaya. Uh, most venerable uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, I must uh, say that uh, we are indeed uh, mm. very, very grateful for sparing the valuable time and mm. uh, giving this very, very uh, inspiring. And also, mm. as I said, uh, the spe uh, a talk uh, on the special uh, sacred day of Vesak, uh, which has uplifted uh, the learnings of everyone. And I'm sure that it would have made a big difference to everyone. Uh, I'm also pleased to say that the International Dhamma Program uh, uh, has decided uh, uh, to make a, a donation, and uh, uh, this time uh, we, we are. Uh, I, I have been privileged to, uh, with my family, to uh, uh, be a part of that, and I will uh, be sending it uh, 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 maybe uh, by uh, uh, making the donation to the bank account uh, that has been given. And I must also mention to all our Dhamma friends that if you all wish to uh, make any contributions, donations uh, for our uh, uh, venerable priests and theros, uh, kindly uh, let me know so that uh, you can also uh, partake in this. So uh, uh, once again, much merit to uh, hmm. uh, venerable Bhikkhu uh, Bodhi. Uh, can we uh, wind up by if uh, we can pay merit uh, uh, to the departed uh, and the uh, uh, devas, sadhu so and so. So I do the chanting for sharing the merits. Is... That's right. That's right. Oh, okay. Okay. So we'll do the sharing of the merits with the devas, the nagas, and other spirits, asking them to protect the Buddha sasana in the world, to protect the teaching of the Dhamma and to protect ourselves and others. Akasa ta chabumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirangra kandusasanang. Akasa ta chabumata 
Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anomoditva Chirang Rakantu Deisanang Akasa Ta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anomoditva Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Dukha Pata Chani Dukha Baya Pata Chani Baya Soka Pata Chani Soka Antu Sabepi Panino. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Much merit to uh, most venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. And uh, uh, we wish uh, that this uh, Vesak uh, on this uh, very sacred day. I know that uh, today the commencement of the program was uh, with our uh, Sri Lankan program and uh, much merit and we are mm -hmm. very grateful to Venerable Tero for making the time available mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, are confident that uh, the Buddha Dhamma uh, will uh, uh, be going to very much greater heights and also the teaching will be taken worldwide by our Venerable Bhikkhus, uh, led by uh, the most Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, Okay. Right. Okay, thank I'll have you. to sign off now because yes. I have to go yeah. up the hill. Right. Okay, so thank you for hosting. Right. Thank you, thank you. Much merit, much merit. Much merit to you, uh, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Nice to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa.